Ode to a Nightingale by John Keats, written sometime in the summer of 1819, which was a very hot summer. An ode is a song of praise, and this is an ode to the bird, the nightingale. It can be quite boring, it can be very strict in its rhyme scheme and a little bit dum-de-dum, but Keats is doing something slightly different here, and he had a different form of rhyme scheme and form. So there's a strategy to approaching uh, Keats or any poem, and one of the first ways is with rhyme scheme, and then follow with metre and form. So, let's have a look at the rhyme scheme in the first stanza. A. Shan't read it all, you can see it. B. So this is the way you annotate a rhyme scheme, simply using the alphabet. The first rhyme is A, the second B, and follows. And then you can see the repetitions, or perhaps the occasional forces of rhyme, when it doesn't quite rhyme but almost does, and use of couplets and, and other elements of rhyme scheme. And if it comes out like this one has, uh, very formal, A, B, A, B, C, D, E, C, then you know that you have a formal rhyme scheme. So um, that's the first thing to note about Ode to a Nightingale. It has a formal rhyme scheme. The next thing is a little bit more difficult, and that's meter, which basically means beat. And beat relates to the number of syllables you might have in a line. And so we've got five word pairs. We've basically got ten syllables, five word pairs. Word pairs are known as feet. The stress is one unstressed and one stressed. That is known as iambic pentameter, pent being ten. Um, it's difficult. People don't always read according to the stress that the poet might have intended. But in terms of, of, of the strategy and working out what this poem is, these two things, the rhyme scheme and the iambic pentameter, suggest a sonnet. But a sonnet is a 14-line poem, and this is only a 10 line stanza. So it works like a sonnet. Um, it has the form and rhyme scheme of a sonnet, but in the end it isn't one. It's, it's m using that form and that style, but not adhering to it entirely, because he's writing a longer poem. He's writing a poem with several stanzas. A sonnet stands on its own in 14 lines. So once you've established that um, form, rhyme scheme, metre, uh, you've got a, a good way to start any essay on any poem. And then you can start looking at the content, what the poet is actually saying or trying to say. So one of the first things to say about this poem, this ode, is that it's in first-person narrative stance. It's from the point of view of the poet. And the poet is sitting outside on a lovely summer's evening, a warm, warm summer that year, and uh, enjoying the sound of the nightingale. And the first thing he does is, is invoke that lovely, warm feeling of drowsiness and sleepiness that goes with just lazing around on a summer evening. But there's a little bit more to his theme here than just being drowsy, which is kind of typical Keats. Hemlock is a poison. It's a clue to the idea that he's perhaps going to talk about a little bit more than just a nightingale, a little bit more than just being drowsy on a summer's eve. Um, Hemlock was the poison used to kill Socrates, uh, and it paralyzes you from the feet up. Uh, so it's a, a slow, drowsy numbness that causes your death. And that goes, of course, with the third reference to that kind of chemical, as it were, the dull opiate. Um, and you have a, a sort of triadic then 
a list of three that um, hints at sleepiness, but also death, poison. And leith, that's another word that um, hints at death. It's another word for the river of Hades. And so it, it, it's all about sinking towards death. Keats used many classical references. Um, uh, he mixed them up a bit. And uh, if you don't know your classics, it's sometimes difficult to know who's Roman, who's Greek and who's a Druid. But we'll work through that. The light-winged dryad of the trees is a type of woodland fairy, nymph, possibly an elf. So uh, he's using these references. And he also uses his archaic language for his own time. Uh, he was not so likely to have used the word thou in ordinary speech, but he does in the poem. And he's addressing the nightingale. He's talking to the nightingale, comparing her uh, to a woodland fairy, or it might be a he. And then um, talking about the, the wonderful singing, full-throated ease. Compound adjectives is something that Keats uses a lot uh, to emphasise his, his poetry, to increase the impact of what he writes. He uses it as a pre-modifier, as drowsy, in drowsy numbness is a pre-modifier, and dull is a pre-modifier to dull opiate. That is the feature of, of poetry and of Keats. Light-winged is another compound adjective uh, that pre-modifies the dryad, and you can get a sense of a tiny little woodland fairy flitting between the trees. So, the second stanza. Nice little non verba filler here, an exclamatory O. Oh, that kind of brings about that feeling of joy and ecstasy and is quite conversational. Talking to the nightingale, talking, of course, to the reader. And this is, this draught of vintage is exactly what you might think it is. He means a glass of wine. And he knows a little bit about wine. Uh, and how it's made, because he goes on to say that hath been called a long age in a deep delved earth. Nice bit of alliteration there, another compound adjective. So he means he'd like a, a, a nice glass of wine that's been matured for a while. You can see him tasting it, tasting of flora and the country green. So you can see him sort of smelling the wine, swilling it round and discussing whether or not it has a little bit of earthiness or a little bit of rose hip or a little bit of, of whatever it is that wine tasters and wine experts are able to taste in a good glass of wine. So quite cheerful at this point. Just one more thing would make this evening perfect. A nice glass of wine. And he also does mean wine from the south of France. I guess in this country wine was not grown so much in those days so you did have to get your wine from the south of France. So he he is quite an expert for such a young man in wine as it were. So he's, he's evoking wine as, as part of this great summer, a beaker full of warmth, uh, full of the warmth of the south of France. Saying as, you, as, uh, as sometimes you do when you have a very hot evening in, in this country, that it feels like somewhere else. It feels like the south of France. It feels like Italy. And a beaker full of the warm south is a, a metaphor that makes the glass of wine uh, like the weather. Another reference here to something um, classical, a mythical waterfall. So he's, he's describing his perfect evening, the one thing it's missing is a good glass of wine, a bit of dance, a mythical waterfall, purple stained mouth, of course, red wine, a little bit too much red wine can leave its uh, mark on the, on the face and the mouth. And then he gets back to his theme. It's all going very well. This is, you know, the perfect evening, perfect night. And then all of a sudden he starts talking about death again, as he did in the first stanza, talking about hemlock and dull opiates and numbness and paralysis. Now he's talking about death and the hope for a peaceful death. 
that actually on such an evening as this, in the warmth with a glass of wine and the nightingale singing, this would be a good way to go. This would be a quiet slipping away into oblivion, uh, painless and not fraught or, or bitter or miserable. So he's never far from thinking about death. And this stanza carries on that theme, but in, in a slightly darker tone. He repeats the words from the last line of the previous stanza, just to emphasise this idea of fading away. And he re-emphasises it with, the, with far away. It's easy to think this might be about a nightingale. In fact, the general theme is a little bit more about death. And death, of course, certainly the deaths or many of the deaths that Keats had seen and his time as a, a surgeon working in London were not so peaceful. So he uses this triadic, the weariness, the fever and the threat, the power of three and alliteration and a quite strong pairing, the fever and the threat, to describe death more as he knows it, more as he has seen it. Being a surgeon at that time, amputating people's limbs and uh, conducting operations in front of an audience without anaesthetic was a rough career to have, and he did it for a while. Here he talks about old age, where palsy shakes a few sad last grey hairs, so this is more about a, a natural passing of old age um, and he signifies that with this talk of palsy which is at the shaking perhaps of older people and modifies it with the idea of uh, how sad it is and, and slightly pathetic it is at, uh, at an older age. And he's listing for the meter so he gives a little bit of extra wording just to make sure that everything fits into the form that he's chosen. This is a less pleasant reference to death. Youth grows pale, so now he's talking about young death and it's it's widely thought that what he's thinking of here or who he's thinking of here is his brother Tom who died earlier that year and was young and died of tuberculosis, spectre thin. So this is something that he'd seen uh, he'd nursed his brother through and of course sadly for Keats although he didn't know it at the time it was also to be his own death. Tuberculosis was a highly contagious disease and if you spent too much time with anyone with it you were most likely to contract it yourself. And of course the aspect of thin again a compound adjective but that hints at ghost that also carries the idea of death uh, and what's what's coming. Um, and it is strong imagery. It, you can see immediately a, a, a young man's face and the effect that death does have or serious illness does have on people as they as they die. If we go back a bit and have a look at the groaning as well. And yes, that refers to the fact that Keats uh, nursed his brother. Should by now know that this is a compound adjective and it is pre-modifying the despairs. So this stanza moves away from the nightingale. We haven't had a mention of the nightingale. Suddenly we're in another world. We're in a world of weariness, fever and fret, of death of old men young men who grow pale and thin, of leaden-eyed despairs, uh, the kind of despair that surrounds uh, the deathbed of someone who's, who's loved, the way people feel and look when they suffer grief, um, and of course the effect of death on beauty and, and the future love pine at them beyond tomorrow cannot pine at them. So where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. So it, it, everything ends, love turns to grief, beauty fades into death, life leaves the eyes. It is a truly depressing stanza in what was supposed to be a nice evening. So now he sort of 
gets a bit more proactive at this point and, and makes a declarative statement, away, away, for I will fly to thee, using anaphora, the repetition of the same word straight after afterwards. And he's trying to send away his bad thoughts on this lovely night back to the wine. Um, definitely needed a glass of wine, really, to perhaps stop thinking about death. Now we have some more classical references. Bacchus, Bacchanalia, God of Wine. So we're, uh, yeah, we're back, of course, onto, onto a little bit of booze to improve the evening. Not charioted by his pards, which is a collapsing of the word leopards. So Bacchus had leopards to, to uh, pull his chariot. Slightly dangerous form of transport, but that's the legend and so he uses it. But that's not the way that Keats is going to go or follow the nightingale. He's not going to follow her or it on a, or him, uh, on a leopard-pulled chariot with Bacchus and wine. He's going to follow her using poetry, on the wings of poetry, the viewless wings of poetry. You don't physically see, but you see with the wings of poetry. And that was his great ambition, to be a great poet, to be part of the Romantic Poet Movement. So then he talks about, though the dull brain perplexes and retards, so he can't always think of the poetry that he would like to uh, express, perhaps because he's drunk too much, or perhaps because he hasn't, or just because it's difficult to write poetry. And then he uses the phrase tender is the night, which was used as the title for a famous novel by F. Scott Fitzgerald, who also wrote The Great Gatsby. Keats, like Shakespeare, has put one or two lexical sets into the English language, Ode to Autumn being another one, a uh, season of mellow mists and fruitfulness. Uh, comes from Keats' Ode to Autumn. Tender is the Night is another one of these. So a little bit of personification here, Queen Moon. So it's, it's well into the night now. The moon has risen and there are stars in the, in the sky, still warm, and he can still hear the nightingale. The nightingale is quite a loud bird. If you are wandering about in the evening and hear a bird singing in the night, it is most likely to be a nightingale and it will be quite loud. And just for a little bit of colour, he's put one or two more mythical creatures into the poem. And a little bit of alliteration just to uh, uh, remind us that we are reading a poem. And it is quite dark, except from the light, the light from the stars and the moon, mainly from the moon. And that's important for, for what he says in the next stanza, because he's lost, in a sense, well, not in a sense, he has lost a sense, and that's the sense of sight. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs. But in embalmed darkness, guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass. So, so what he's got here is, is saying, I, don't, I can't see the flowers, but I can smell them. Off on a very hot evening, the scent of flowers is, is much more intense and you can identify if not individual flowers, you can smell the grass, you can smell the honeysuckle. And that's why he uses the word embalmed, because embalming is a, a form of treatment after death to preserve bodies and, of course, to cover any smell. So he's moved away from death a bit, but he's returning to it here. Yes, just here, there's a hint of a forced rhyme. He's reversed what you could say was wild fruit tree to fruit tree wild so that he can get that rhyme with child. The, the problem for a poet with using a very formal uh, form of poetry is that you can get stuck trying to make things rhyme or trying to make them fit the meter. So words sometimes are reordered rhymes are sometimes forced a bit 
so that you can stick to that um, form. And Keats is quite keen on his form. What he's doing here is listing the plants and he's telling you what month it is in white hawthorn, pastoral eglantine, that tends to be sort of the beginnings of brambles, blackberry flowers and things like that. Violets that have already come up and are going and mid-May's eldest child, the, the coming musk rose, the wild rose, and full of dewy, dewy wine of scent. So he's now reflected on the fact that on such an evening you can't see the beauty of summer but you can smell it and and feel it in the warmth of the of the night um and of course he's uh, personified mid-may um by identifying it as the mother of the of the musk rose or of the plants and he's told us where we are must have been a very warm year for mid-may to be that warm he also mentions flies on a summer eve which he could have mentioned bees but flies again tiny bit of a hint of death at the beginning of the next stanza he uses the word darkling which is a present participle it makes him dynamic as he listens hiding in the dark darkling i listen and for many a time i've been half in love with easeful death so we're back to that uh theme um, the capital letter emphasizes death the uh, pre-modified easeful suggests the theme of the poem that what he's talking about is on such a night this could be a an easeful death this could be a good way to go and he personifies death called him soft names in many a mused rhyme so he's he's personified death as as we often do the grim reaper or whatever but he seems to say i don't actually call him the grim reaper i call him soft names i welcome him perhaps or have seen him welcomed by his patients perhaps even by his brother at the end of his life and he carries on with this theme now more than ever it seems rich to die to cease upon the midnight with no pain if we could choose perhaps that is the way we would choose to go but not quite as young as Keats. This aspect of dying is, is a romantic view of dying and that the um, key element of the romantic movement at the time, both in, in art, visual art and, and poetry, was to somehow ennoble life as it was. So it didn't mean romance in, in, the, in terms of relationships. It meant romance in terms of making the ordinary noble, so the paintings of people in the fields looking at um, beautiful sunsets and looking healthy and strong, even though actually the reality is much harder than that. Um, on the final line, um, he refers to death again, a requiem is in the semantic field for death. And uh, Requiem is a piece of music played at a funeral, um, referring to death. And Sod here uh, could be a, a, a homonym, a pun, spelt the same, but it has two meanings. Sod means earth. When you dig a clod of earth, it can also be called a, a sod, but it can mean a person. There's a very famous epitaph on a gravestone which says, under this sod lies another. Now he's back talking to the nightingale. He did a little bit in the in the previous stanza, but he's talking more directly to it here. And here, death is abstract. It is the it is the abstract noun rather than the personification. And he's suggesting the bird is immortal. It's a technical way of of saying directly addressing direct mode of address. This is a metaphor here. Immortal bird. The bird itself is not immortal, but with the capital B, it it represents the nightingales who sing through the ages. So for many, many centuries there have been nightingales and they have sung uh, their tunes to many young men and young women and older men and women on warm summer evenings. So the voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. So it, it's, a, it's an equaliser in the sense that you don't have to be an aristocrat to hear the nightingale, you don't have to be clever, 
you can be a court jester, you can be a king. The nightingale sings to everybody. It's an egalitarian bird. And it has been th present throughout history. And he lists now a few points in history that the nightingale was probably at. This is a biblical story, the story of Ruth and Naomi. So he's moved from the classics to the Bible now. Ruth and Naomi were exiled and forced to gather corn in a stranger's field. They did what was called gleaning, which was basically when everything had been harvested, poor people could come in and they could gather what had been dropped by the harvesters. So she, were, she and Naomi were refugees in an alien land. She stood in tears amid the alien corn, and yet the nightingale would have sung to her too. And alien corn pre-modifies uh, corn, gives it a, a really economic way to demonstrate their exile and their alienation from, from where they are. Keats knew his birds a bit, I think. He knew his nightingales. He knows that they're a migratory bird, so he knows that they not only have sung to him in this land on his evening, but also crossed perilous seas and sung to the sailors on the sea. And he thinks of the journey that they, they travel. And he ends that stanza with the word forlorn. And then we're back to death a bit. Forlorn, the very word is like a bell to toll me back from the thee to my soul self, to my lonely self. It is a funeral bell that tolls. And he uses the rhetorical use of anaphora uh, by repeating the word forlorn from the uh, end of the previous stanza and then again at the beginning uh, to add uh, a repetition to it and emphasise it. It's a rhetorical device often used in speeches. The fact that the word is like a bell is, of course, a simile. Keats doesn't often use similes, but on this occasion it seems appropriate. And, of course, the use of the word toll, it is a funeral bell, it's a deep ringing sound, takes us back to the idea of death and all that that implies. And he says, Thy plaintive anthem feeds, past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now it is buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? So it's such a beautiful song that uh, you uh, can't uh, really tell now whether or not it actually existed. Once again, we find that he uses the French word adieu for farewell, goodbye. He seems to be very fond of this, almost to the point of affectation. It is perhaps what prompted Byron to call him cocknified and suburban, a kind of false use of French words. Sometimes he mixed up his Greek and Roman gods. Then he, he is, of course, saying farewell to the nightingale that now is moving away and her plaintiff again another um, sad funereal word anthem fades past the near meadows and he or she flies away over the still stream up the hillside uh, and again now it is buried deep you can't hear the song anymore it's buried deep in the valleys of the uh, of the hillsides that he is um, sitting uh, by it's funeral lexical set to refer to death again. And it's so beautiful that now he's not sure. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. He is now in a sort of trance thinking about uh, the nightingale. Was it a dream? Did he really hear such beauty? Has he fallen asleep or is he awake? Or is he even dead? He, he finishes the poem the, uh, on a set of rhetorical questions. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Do I wake or sleep? And there's the hint there of Shakespeare's Hamlet, who asks to sleep, perchance to dream. And in that case, sleep meant death. So although it appears to be a poem about a nightingale, 
And it is a poem about a nightingale on a hot summer's evening. There is also always the hint, the undertone of death, which of course inhabited so many of the lives of the poets at that time. <laughs> 